following up again on another early lecture. This lecture is going to go more in depth into talking about ozone and what the ozone hole is and why we should be so concerned about it. So you see our image on the right here uh, showing this ozone hole which is at a large extent uh, in October of 2006 and for scale to note that the size that we're seeing here uh, that hole relative uh, is three times that the size of the United States so a very very large area uh, over the southern hemisphere, especially the southern pole here, as we're looking at South Pole uh, and around the area of Antarctica. So we're going to talk about that and really how this brings us to our song choice for the day. So the song choice being Come Together by the Beatles. I know we actually had a Beatles song um, earlier in this uh, in this module. I normally don't like to reuse artists as much as I can resist to, but I think this song is very fitting as we're going to talk about uh, kind of how the problem of the ozone hole really has been solved collectively by many countries and many different societies across our world. So to remind ourselves to go back a little bit, uh, to looking at here the uh, our electromagnetic spectrum, and to note to point out ultraviolet radiation as we have up here. As a note that it is this ultraviolet radiation. Uh, the amount that is emitted by the sun is not a huge amount, but if there is um, quite, uh, enough uh, emitted by the sun, or there's quite a, uh, quite a bit uh, that is emitted and comes into Earth's atmosphere, is this ultraviolet radiation that is essentially blocked out, or most of it is blocked out um, to an extent by ozone. At least much more of it is than uh, otherwise would be if we didn't have our atmosphere. But and we'll get that to, to that. Uh, here in a second on this slide, but first just can ask, okay, well, what exactly is ozone? You know, what is this ozone hole? Why is the problem? You know, why is there a hole in the ozone? We're gonna get to all that here in, the, in these coming slides. So just to note that ozone is actually a molecule that is made up of three oxygen atoms instead of oxygen gas, which we've looked at in some past um, lessons, which is only O2. So we're looking at O3 instead of O2 for the thing thing of this in a chemical makeup type of way. Um, but to note that the ozone layer, again, is this portion of the stratosphere, as we've talked about a little bit prior, that contains relatively high amounts of this ozone. And it's really been stable as far as we understand in terms of proxy records that we can have to try and study this. Um, it's really been stable for hundreds of millions of years, but is now in kind of a relative state of continuous change, um, or at least um, it's been definitely been impacted by uh, human activities. And so the problem, as we'll come to see, is that as ozone loss can pose a really a health risk, and I truly are not only to ourselves but uh, to non-human living things as well. And so, the, because the role again of this um, is to absorb ultraviolet radiation and re-rate the energy at longer wavelengths that are not harmful to us. So, as we can see on the right-hand side here, um, we have this. You know, so, there's actually kind of different forms of UV light, uh, we can think of it as light or UV energy to say, um, and so um, again we still have our latitude vertically here, kind of this area where we have our greatest concentration of ozone, and to note um, that really almost all pretty much of what we term UVC uh, energy, which is the highest uh, energy or as the shortest wavelength, is pretty much all uh, absorbed or kind of and, and re-radiated at longer wavelengths by that ozone. Uh, there's a small, relatively small proportion of the UVB uh, energy uh, coming in, and again, that's kind of in between UVC and UVA, which UVA is the longest wavelengths out of uh, this at least, you know, category that we have for ultraviolet light. Um, more of that is able to penetrate through, um, in turn, than UVB. So you know, there is some UVB and more UVA that is able to penetrate through relative to. Uh, that, that UVC that is almost all absorbed, but to know that, that UVB and UVA can still be quite harmful to us um, and in many ways, as we'll come to see. Because uh, noted here is, you know, okay, so why should we worry about ozone? Well, UV rays have numerous negative impacts on human health, so not only, uh, as you most likely would know if you've heard about this prior, um, talking about skin cancer or melanoma, you know, at, at maybe at a day-to-day -day level, something like you are more easily to be sunburned if um, there's less ozone to protect us. Um, you know, 
figure out in the sun for a long time, of course, that is the UV that UV uh, radiation that is causing you to be sunburned, or you know, of course, over many exposures of that, more likely to develop skin cancer or melanoma. Um, and you know, to note that melanoma cases uh, relatively have been much higher in, in past decades, um, in previous few decades, and you know, generally to note that it is based on some studies and around where one in five Americans will develop uh, skin cancer in their lifetime. Um, and whether how severe that is, whether that can be dealt with is another question, but again, and that's pretty frequent. Um, and, but also other issues with cataracts with the eyes, so um, and impacting your eyes and ability to see, you know, immune system suppression, all these are possible problems or you know, issues to worry about on our own you know, you know, physical health that can be caused or you know exacerbated by um, frequent exposure to high relatively high levels of ultraviolet uh, radiation and so the U national weather service actually issues a daily uv index i have the link you can see here and also on the right hand side you know this image to show you, you know, um, actually you, know, you can go there every day i mean it's updated and so they kind of have the scaling of exposure levels you know how long you know, relatively you should be out, you know, you know with or without. You know, generally, you know, they're advocating most of the time to wear some sort of protection, uh, whether that's just you know, long sleeve or you know long pant clothing, or you know sunblock, whatever it may be. Um, but you know, kind of noting there kind of what different exposure levels you can have, um, and uh, noting there on, that's all noted there on the right. So again, there's a link there also on the bottom left where you can go to look at that site and have the most updated uh, for every day. So bringing this back to the ozone layer, so again, this isn't that naturally occurring layer in the stratosphere, and so under natural conditions, there's, you know, firstly, really prior to human impact, we know, that, or, you know, really, and what is still ongoing, mostly is, is this ozone production and ozone destruction are relatively balanced. So that there's this ozone cycle image here on the bottom left that shows that, how it's produced and how it's destroyed. Really, you know, before human interaction, you know, with this or influence on this, really, you know, that was in pretty much equilibrium. There's about equal amount being produced as there was that was being destroyed naturally. Um, and we can measure this uh, con ozone concentration as well uh, with what we term a the Dobson unit. So to note that an average ozone layer thickness, um, or what we term average, kind of prior to a lot of human interaction and influence on it um, was about 300 dops in units, but um, in the ozone hole, especially when it forms, um, the concentration of ozone is only about one dops in units. So we can, you know, dops in units. You're like, well, okay, what does that? What does that even mean? Like, what, how do you measure that? Um, so I have that visual here on the bottom left that shows kind of one dops in unit is about one millimeter, about the. Um, you know, height of a penny or a dime, for example, uh, for U.S. currency. So, I'm you know, pretty thin in terms of actual amount there, um, but you know, able to you know, that difference of only about two millimeters, you know, in in that gaseous uh, ozone is a lot uh, in terms of protecting us uh, up in the stratosphere. So, the question is, well, what? Okay, then, well, what's been happening to this ozone? What what has been? Uh, you know, um, as we saw on that last slide, you know, the ozone hole is not a complete hole devoid of any ozone, but at least a, a reduction of the ozone. So what's been doing that? Um, and so the ozone, we've actually had ozone monitoring stations almost for about a century um, in certain locations um, and kind of spread them out more and more um, uh, after about a century ago that when we started having them. And particularly we started noticing in the 1970s a pronounced decrease in ozone concentration or in many places around the world. And that decrease was tied to uh, a chemical compound that, that was human-made that are known as uh, me, chlorofluorocarbons, so CFCs for short. And so again, these were created initially in the 1930s, um, but really became widespread in use in the 1950s and 1960s, which led to us starting to see this pronounced decrease in ozone concentration in the late 1960s and in the 1970s, um, because they became widespread in use um, for things such as coolants in refrigerators, propellants in spray cans, making styrofoam, a number of these industrial uses. Um, because at the time, you know, they re seemed really appealing because they were non-toxic, they're non-flammable, 
Um, they generally don't really react too much chemically with many things, um, and so that allows them um, you know, to seem pretty stable. And, and they, at the time you know, of first development, we didn't you know, have any knowledge that they would you know, ser seriously impact any uh, environmental uh, concerns that we might have. So you know, we started using a lot of these. Um, but because of those characteristics, that also means that they are able to persist um, within the environment, you know, within our atmosphere, um, and eventually, you know, be spread out and kind of be pushed up to some extent into the stratosphere, and um, where they can have quite a bit of residence time, um, you know, in terms of human lifespan, you know, a human lifespan or two, so 75 to 150 years potentially um, before they break down. Um, so we can see this on the right hand side here, where this kind of decrease, especially of ozone uh, minimums, is again in the Antarctic, and I'll come back to why that is in a little bit. Um, but to, you know, note that it's, again, it's up in the stratosphere where we have this ultraviolet radiation um, it, that is being broken apart. Excuse me, the ultraviolet, the ultraviolet radiation that breaks um, the bond of these chlorofluorocarbons, of, of this chlorine atom off of those CFCs. And it's those chlorine atoms particularly that are participating in a series of chemical reactions that destroy ozone, um, essentially return that free, now free chlorine atom to the atmosphere unchanged and it destroys more and more and more ozone over and over again again because of that long residence time of chlorine especially um, you just saw you know 75 to 150 years before it might break down or get back down lower in the environment and be uh, chemically combined with something else um, we you know can see quite a lot of destruction of ozone um, tied to this so um, we've been kind of alluding to or talking around um, ozone depletion is most severe in the South Pole or relatively around Antarctica, um, although this does vary seasonally and we can have lesser um, extents of ozone in other, uh, around other locations of the Earth. Um, but there's a seasonal variation and it's concentrated around this area most severely um, because the chlorofluorocarbons from the northern hemisphere um, become uh, concentrate over Antarctica due to atmospheric circulation wind patterns that push them there and also um, tied to this concept of the polar vortex. So you may actually have heard of this uh, concept in, in weather a little bit in national news more for um, the northern hemisphere and or, or the Arctic circle and um, because we can have this a similar phenomenon occurring with the northern or uh, the Arctic circle and that very cold air from the polar North Pole being pushed down into more southerly latitudes and bring very cold winter weather uh, to many places in the United States, oftentimes in the winter, um, which has given it a lot of news in recent years. But we have a similar phenomenon over the southern hemisphere. Again, this is tied to this idea, or, you know, this, we have this part of the year where the Antarctic Circle is in complete darkness. It gets very, very cold there when you get that's very dense air, as we'll talk about when we talk about density of air uh, in a future lesson. A very cold, dense air kind of all sinks together um, and, and it's, gives the right conditions for these chlorine atoms that are in the atmosphere that are pushed there to really um, fully um, be able to destroy a lot of ozone under those conditions. So, and we have some links here. You can go and look at the data in, in the individual uh, time period. Um, from NASA's this ozone watch site um, where you can look at the most recent conditions as I have shown here on the right hand side the most recent that I was able to find so you can look at the different seasons they keep track of through dates um, what the ozone hole area uh, extent is so you know that peaks um, in the in southern hemisphere winter time um, and so and we can see this ozone hole area how that um, becomes much greater during that time period and then eventually breaks up um, once uh, the sun comes back um, over the southern hemisphere, and more air is moved around. So we're not going to, you know, that's enough focusing on that process. And, but you know, I just want to bring this back then to more is the social aspects of okay, well, what have we done about the ozone hole to finish? Um, and so again, noting it was in the 1970s where we really started recognizing. Um, this ozone hole, you know, observing it with instruments and starting and then, you know, in the mid 1970s, actually recognizing what the mechanism of ozone, ozone depletion was that we just talked through. And so, fortunately, uh, that led to generally across uh, the world, kind of CFC production starting to begin to decline in the late 1970s. 
Um, you know, actually having a U.S. federal ban on that in the, in, the, in the late 1970s, although that was reversed for some portion of the 1980s by, uh, the, by the U.S. federal administration. Um, but generally then moving at a more global scale, especially by the late 1980s, um, starting to move towards this uh, establishment uh, of reducing them, dealing with them. And so we had this first meeting around this uh, known as the Montreal and really um, development of a plan to deal with this by the, uh, the Montreal Protocol in 1987, essentially uh, makes a long-term goal to reduce production of those um, and then a kind of amendment to that a few years later shifted that agreement to phase out uh, chlorofluorocarbons country by the year 2000 um, and you know, again that continued to be updated so really by the year 2000 um, we had a large reduction in that we haven't seen a complete reduction in use of that by all countries around the world but a large reduction at least in use and production of CFCs. And we are starting to now see at least a little bit of recovery. So we can see I'm kind of this initial, so this graph here is now sh is showing um, kind of this reduction that we saw from our, um, in our ozone and our, in the establishment of that ozone hole. So there's you know, measurements that were made. So again, this is our measurement in the Dobson units, or I think it was kind of as millimeters of so one, two, three, up to four millimeters here. And you know, and we see this reduction for, through the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, to up to 2000, kind of at our lowest extent here. And so this is this was from 2015. So really, this is a trend line that we're. You know, this is all projected, of course, into the future, but because of you know, this is a production based on you know, largely reducing uh, the uh, amount of CFCs that are, are, you know, can be used that can be produced across the the globe. Um, and as this was a 2015. Uh, image that's produced by NASA and actually even as an update so this is just a very recent um, one here now from 2018 this bottom link here that actually talks about the uh, first NASA study and a more direct proof of that we're actually starting to see some ozone hole recovery so again it will be kind of a long road um, you have you know if you're you know, fairly young at this stage in your life you know maybe over our most of our lifetimes before we see this kind of Incre back increase towards um, what we had before the 1970s and you know this intervent and really a lot of interaction intervention um, influence on that ozone with these chlorofluorocarbons but it seems like now we're on this you know, projection this nice projection forward of having it establish itself back out as we you know, have largely pushed out the use of these chlorofluorocarbons.